Good morning. Welcome to Grace this morning, and a special hello to our online folks as well. We have quite a bit going on today, and it's so lovely to see so many folks here on this beautiful Sunday. We've had so much rain, it's nice to have a little sunshine. Um, Let me direct your attention to a couple announcements. First of all, a couple of thank yous. This radio and online services are in memory of Doris and Karen from Welton Anderson today, and the bulletins in memory of Bob Tweet from his family. And we also have some beautiful altar flowers that were donated from uh, Liz Overlander's funeral, and we thank the family for sharing those with us. Coming up in our life today, this afternoon, for 5th through 8th graders, there's a scavenger hunt, which will involve some pizza as well, and that will be from starting at noon today until about 1.30, and then afterwards is a ninth grade confirmation class. So hopefully all you kiddos, 5th to ninth grade, can make it on down and enjoy us for this fun event. Um, we have some Bible studies that are also resuming the two notes. The first is the women's Bible study led by Emily Stelter on Revelation. It has been meeting on Mondays traditionally, and they have decided to move to Tuesday afternoon at 2 instead. So that will make change will happen this week. And also this week, the men's Bible study is going to resume downstairs, and they are going to meet at 8.30 a.m. on Thursdays, if you'd like to be a part of that. Um... Finally, Persevering Love, the Grief Support Group, we're moving into our second session. But remember, if you didn't make it to the first one, they're not linked. So you're welcome to attend whenever your schedule allows and if you feel the need to come and join us. We're happy to have as many as are able to join. The myth we're going to be looking at this week surrounding grief and loss is that God will never give me more than I can handle. And we'll talk about where the truth is with that using some scripture and discussion. And that is this Thursday also at 10 a.m. in the fireside, uh, in the fireside room, in the Grace Lounge. (laughs) I'm mixing my churches up. Let us stand together, greet one another with a, a peace sign or a hello, and let's wave to our camera, and we'll set our hearts and minds to beginning worship today.
Let us confess our sins. Please pray with me. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Now, God, who, in, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead to sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, you give us your Son as the vine apart from whom we cannot live. Nourish our life in his resurrection, that we may bear the fruit of love and know the fullness of joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. June Petula is our lector this morning. The first reading is from Psalm number four. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, O Lord. Make me lie down in safety. The word of the Lord. And the lesson is from 1 John chapter 3, beginning in the, at, on verse 1. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is that when this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either, has either seen him or knows him. Little children, let, a, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. Be Please stand for the gospel acclamation. The Holy Gospel this morning is a reading from St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory. Glory to you, O Lord. 
And while they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. And so Jesus said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate in their presence. And then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead, and on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Just wanted to invite you downstairs for coffee uh, after we have our worship time together upstairs. And then while you're down having coffee and perhaps a little snack, we're going to sneak in a little congregational meeting without you even knowing it. So um, that'll happen, that'll happen uh, right after our worship time. Well, happy Easter. Happy Easter. Uh, uh, our happy Easter was just two weeks ago, right? Um, and it seems, at least for me, that Easter goes by way too fast. And so um, I'm glad that the scriptures this week takes us back to the events of Easter. Not this past Easter, but to the very first Easter. Today's story takes place that first Easter evening, and so we have some time to slow down and to to go back and, and stay in the events of that first, the very first Easter, Easter day. Uh, that first Easter was jam-packed. Um, it had all kinds of events going on. It, it didn't end with the events of Easter morning with the women at the tomb. There was so much more that happened. In the morning after those women had excitedly told what they had seen, Peter ran in and peeked and left the tomb as fast as he entered the tomb. He was amazed, according to Luke. And then a few hours after that, perhaps in the middle of that Easter afternoon, maybe after Easter brunch, we could say, right, at, right, after, right after brunch, two of Jesus' disciples were walking and discussing their puzzlement at what had happened that first Easter day. They had no idea what the empty tomb meant. They had no idea why on earth Jesus' body wasn't in the tomb. And maybe, maybe they were wondering if they had been deceived by this Jesus. Maybe they were wondering if they had been naive in believing in this one that they had followed. And certainly it didn't look to them as though much of life had changed in any way after that that first Easter. But then the resurrected Jesus appeared and broke bread with those two as they were walking along and discussing these things. And then they recognized Jesus. They recognized Jesus as walking with them. And then just a few hours later on that same day, they found the other disciples. They were all huddled together. And and after they had told the story of the resurrected Christ coming to them and becoming known to them, then uh, uh, the resurrected Christ appeared to them as well. And that's where we get into the words of our gospel text this morning. I mean, it's still Easter Day. So much had been happening all day long, and the resurrected Christ appears to them. 
And these early followers of Jesus, they think that they're seeing a ghost. That's what Luke tells us. They thought that they were seeing a ghost at first and they were frightened. And Jesus says to them, why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Why are you frightened and why are doubts arising in your hearts? Those very first disciples have very little confidence in that first Easter. They were frightened. They were doubting. And Jesus notices this. Now, if you just think about that, when, when somebody is living with authentic confidence, you just know it, don't you? You just know when someone is living life full of confidence. You know, they can look you right in the eye. You know, they're, they're not shy about that. They look you in the eye when they're talking to you, uh, when they're speaking with you. And they have this conviction that whatever life throws at them, whatever it might be, that they can handle it, that they'll make it through. They're willing to take risks. They're willing to run challenges. When they talk to you, you don't have to guess what they are really thinking about. They just speak the truth, and they speak the truth in a gracious way. This is people that live with a lot of confidence do. Right now, if this is you, you're sitting straight up. You're sitting straight up and your shoulders are back and your head is high and you're ready for life. You're not slouching. Some of you are slouching right now. (laughs) But you're ready for life when you're full of confidence. Who doesn't want to be confident in life? Who doesn't want to be around people who are confident in life? On the other hand, when somebody is living where their confidence has just gotten beaten out of them, when the evil one whispers, well, you can't do this, and you're never going to make it through this. You don't have what it takes, and it just makes you less joyful, doesn't it? It actually makes you less generous. It kind of robs life out of you. It makes everything harder. It's harder to do a good job when you take on a task, when you are living without any confidence. It's harder to ask somebody out for a date when you're living without any confidence, right? How many of you can relate to that? Well, thank you. Thank you, (laughs) Dell. It's harder to perform well at work. Have you ever seen somebody when they're, when they're going to give a talk right up in front of a group of people and then they're just, and they're just like, you know, they're like flopping sweat from their brow and they're panicky, you know, it's, it's hard to give a talk, it's harder to give a sermon when you don't have confidence, right? So a natural question is before us, then where can we get confidence for life? Where can we get confidence for living? Because we'd all rather live with confidence, I think, than without confidence, right? Am I, am I with you there or are you with me here? <laughs> sure, we all want to live with more confidence, not less confidence. And I was thinking this week, maybe the person, maybe the guy who has more grounds for confidence, humanity, uh, 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 humanity-wise, right, um, more than anyone else who can re- actually live with great confidence would be an individual, a man by the name of Tom Brady. Do you, do you know Tom Brady? You happen to know Tom, Tom Brady? I mean, um, women are looking a little more uh, like glazed over in their eyes right, right now. But it's no, no big surprise here. Tom Brady is just ridiculously good-looking. He's got great hair. He's got a great smile. He's amazingly talented. He's a winner, right? He's won how many Super Bowls? Seven. Seven Super Bowls. Six with the New England Patriots and then one with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And, and he was declared MVP. MVP, like, I think, like five times. How many times has the Vikings won the Super Bowl? Do any of you know? 
He's got seven Super, he's got seven Super Bowl Super Bowl rings. Um, it's just amazing. He's married to a supermodel, for crying out loud. Well, we're all married to supermodels, right? I mean, we all are. Uh, but he's, he's famous all around the world, and he has a gazillion dollars. So humanly speaking, if you want to live always confident, guys, just be born like Tom Brady. Just be born with incredible athletic ability and amazing leadership skills and be really popular and win seven Super Bowls, right? Um, And marry a supermodel. Well, some of you have already done that, but uh, have great hair, have great teeth, and be a world-famous gazillionaire. Now, if you're a woman right now and you're sitting next to a man and he's looking a little depressed or... Or maybe a little downcast. uh, Just reach over and pat them on the arm, and and then just whisper whisper to them, uh, "It's too late for you, honey. (laughs) It's too late for you." But there's another way. There's don't say that to your husband. All right, don't say that. I'm just joking. Don't actually do that. So Jesus comes to these first disciples on that first Easter. Those confidence-depleted followers. And Jesus says to them, why are you frightened? Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? And then he says something strange. He says, well, do you have anything to eat here? (laughs) Do you got anything to eat? And so they share in some broiled fish. And after the meal, that first Easter dinner seemed to change their confidence level. Just because those first disciples knew that Jesus was walking with them, Jesus slowed down enough to walk with those first disciples. He didn't have to. He slowed down enough to have a meal with those first disciples. He didn't have to, but Jesus did. And Jesus raised their confidence level because of that. And we at least know this, that the disciples gained greater confidence uh, after this dining experience with Jesus because they were given the confidence to continue the faith. Confidence enough so that you and I would be part of this great movement in the world called the church. That was their confidence level that Jesus gave them. You see, when Jesus is present in all his authority, when Jesus is present in all his vulnerability, he has this amazing dynamic where people would just be themselves and they'd stop pretending tax collectors and Gentiles and prostitutes and lepers, this little community where people would just take off their masks because they weren't living in a pandemic, but they would take off the masks that they had put on for themselves. Jesus hated it when people pretended, and He actually went after it. He called it hypocrisy. And Jesus actually coined, He coined hypocrisy as we use that word today. Jesus was the first one to use it in that way because he hated it when people would use faith or use God or use religion to make other people pretend to be better than they are or to be somebody that they're not. For us to be a community where you can just come in and be real, that's the only way to actually have true confidence. And that's what Jesus gave his first disciples. And that's what Jesus gives you and gives me. What matters is not how much confidence you have. What matters is what you're putting your confidence in. That's really what matters. And we live in a society where self-confidence can be very much an individualistic thing, you know, and people think, well, it's just about me. It's just about enhancing my own life, kind of a self-help thing. But we learn from Scripture is that God's stories and ours both have a lot of wrinkles 
and nuances and possible meanings. There are a lot of surprises and disappointments and discoveries along the way to work through. There are a lot of unmet expectations and frustrating outcomes to sort out in life. But our confidence is that Christ walks with us even when we don't recognize him right away. But the scriptures proclaim that Christ is with us and that's what gives us confidence because we know who we're putting our confidence in. Even the risen, unrecognized Christ walks with us. And thankfully, Easter is eternal. Jesus has time because Easter is eternal. And we have time too. We have time because grace has already happened. And the happy ending has been secured long before we ever became aware of it. God in Christ Jesus is with us. And he's at our tables. And he's in our homes. And he's at our workplaces. And he's walking with us. He's walking beside us. He's walking before us. He's walking behind us. He's walking with you. That is what gives us the incredible courage and confidence we call faith to follow in life. When the evil is just too strong, when the challenge is too great, when the loss is too much, when the regret is too deep, when the call to love others is too impossible, when the night is too long, when the failure is too enormous, when the future is too bleak, when the world is too scary, we still know that Christ walks with us. And it doesn't really matter how connected you are. It doesn't matter how bright you are, how smart you are, how pretty you are. It doesn't matter if you are a Tom Brady or a Tom Cruise or a Tom Selleck or a Tom Hanks or a Tom Brokaw or a Thomas Jefferson or a Thomas Edison or Thomas Paine or Tom Thumb for crying out loud. What matters is that Christ is with you. Christ is always with you. So this week, practice that confidence in God. We can all do that. When I get up in the morning, my first thought gets to be, God, this is you and me facing this day together. I'll look forward to it right now. And when I'm with other people, I can look them in the eye and be confident that you have blessed me and given me the gifts to care for that person that I am now looking at, to love this person. And I am confident that you, God, with all your grace, will give me all that I need. I don't have to worry about that. This week, I won't compare myself to anybody. This week, I'll believe in great confidence that whatever trouble or difficulty, I will trust that God will work in that because now I trust God, that God is watching out for me. So this week when you go to school, and this week when you go to work, when this week when you are around your family, instead of worrying about all the problems and all the stuff that you haven't figured out, be confident that it's not just you, but it's you and the Savior walking next to you that will work it all out. That's living in confidence. Amen. Please stand as you are able and let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
On third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. Healing and unifying creator, we know that in your orchard you do not see rotten trees or bad apples. Our sight is limited, God, and too often fear clouds our vision to the extent that your goodness in those around us, around us are no, is no longer visible. And we feel as though we are surrounded by enemies. God, give us your eyes to recognize your presence in all of creation. For you see all the colors of the rainbow and call them good. Teach us to see the world through the lens of your love. Lord, in your mercy. Master gardener of our world, your first command to the earth man, Adam, was to tend to your creation. Continue to send your blessings on our farmers and all who are associated with and touched by their hard work and dedication to your earth. As another planting season begins, we ask for the balance of gentle rain and sunlight needed for optimal growth of that which is sown. Lord, in your mercy. God, we know what we are, but not what we may be. We are called to follow Jesus back to Galilee, but the path ahead is not always clear or easy. Lord, help us to trust in your love for us and let us recognize your love and have confidence in who you are in us and through us. Guide us, Lord, along all the paths of our lives, whatever the terrain and wherever we are on this journey of faith and life. Lord, in your mercy. Saving Christ, when they felt all hope was lost, you showed up for your disciples. You offered peace, bared your scars, and opened their minds to the scriptures to help them better understand you. Grant us the same peace and understanding. Help us also to recognize you in our own scars and in the hurts and ills of those around us. We pray especially for Clarice Olson, Joe Olson, Jack Flayton, Jim Anderson, Olivia Baldwin, Tom Bales, Ken Klub, Monica Kennedy, Brad Matson, Laura Thone, Jack Lewis, Bonnie Westfield, Julie Miron, Mary Schomer, Marvin Nelson, Joey Anderson Ernest, and Pat Saltness, and John Perry Peterson, and all those we name aloud and in our hearts silently at this time. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please pray with me. O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need. Awaken us to us the needs of others. And at the end, bring all the world to your feast through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, with whom, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory forever. Amen. And now, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and let us... We forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May he look upon you with favor and give you peace. 
Amen. Our sending song today is Jesus Messiah and is printed for you in your bulletin. Go in peace and serve the Lord.